Welcome to Word Bread. That's what we're, we'll call this. Telling stories, uh, reading chapters from the Bible. And I love it. I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And we're going to read one of the coolest stories that's really deep. It's from 3,000 years ago. But it's very relevant to today also. Uh, and so we'll start out. It's from the book of Ruth. And the book that's right before Ruth is called Judges. And that was a time in the history of Israel where there wasn't a king and there was just people that kind of did what they wanted to do. And they had a, their own culture, which was uh, the Hebrew culture. And there's a couple of things that I need to tell you about before I read you the story so that you understand. And there's two things. One is that back in those days... If a man and a woman were married, the, if the man died so that there was just the woman, she'd be called a widow, right? Did you know that? Yeah. So in those days, if a widow um, lost her husband, then, and she didn't have any kids, and she was going to be alone, then the husband's, the guy who died, his brother would marry her and take her, care of her so she could have kids and a house and a family. And so then if his brother died, if there's another brother, eventually he would do the same thing. So it depends on how many boys What if the brother married. was already married? If the brother was already married back then, they would actually say, okay, you can have more than one wife. Oh. Now we don't do that. But uh, sometimes it could be a problem because the one wife would already be happy with the man. And then if, that, if the brother's brother died, then all of a sudden... He would say, well, honey, I'm supposed to take care of this widow. And, you know, maybe the wife would say, well, I don't want to share. You know, it could be a problem. But they were supposed to do that to take care of people and to make sure everyone had enough. And they had they got to have kids. So that's one thing. And that guy was called a kinsman redeemer. You have to remember that because it's an important part of the story. And the other thing was that when they had, they used to get their field, their, their food from fields. So they would have um, olives or grapes or barley growing. And when the harvesters would come, they didn't have machines. They would come with a big knife or sickle. And they'd cut it and they'd gather it. Uh, There's a specific rule that God made that said, when you gather your harvest, make sure not to gather everything. Don't be spick and span about it. Make sure to leave the edges. And if you drop some, don't go back and pick it up. If you forget to cut a few down, don't go back and get them. Don't shake the whole tree and pick every single grape or olive or anything like that. Because the poor people in the land would be able to go along after and collect. So they would go to the tree. Brian. Hey, come and listen to story time if you like. Okay. You're welcome to think so yeah so if you've ever been if you've ever been in an orchard where there's like lots of trees with fruit so they would pick all the trees let's say apples they pick a bunch of the apples but they'd leave a bunch so that poor people or hungry people or strangers would get to um have some fruit and so that they were called gleaners the people that were poor that would go along and they would look for food were called gleaners and god made a specific rule and said make sure to leave some food in the trees and in the fields, so that the gleaners, so that people, there's enough to go around. So they're supposed to be generous and not try to just have everything. So those are the two things you need to know. I'm going to start reading the story now. In the days when the judges ruled, that means there was just judges in each town, there was a famine in the land. You know what a famine is? That means when the fields don't grow any food and all of a sudden there's no rain. There's no rain, the, and the fields aren't growing food, and people are actually start starving, and they get really hungry. So in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem, have you ever heard of that town before? Bethlehem, in Judah, went to Sorger, and he went to live for a while in the country of Moab, which is right next door. It's sort of like British Columbia is next door to Alberta. Well, Israel was right next door to Moab. So this guy is like, he took his wife and his two sons. He had two sons. He said, let's go to Moab because we're going to starve here. I don't know if there's going to be enough food. It's looking pretty tight. So he and his wife and his two sons left. The name of the man was Elimelech. 
and his name was as uh, the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of the two sons were Mahlon and Chilion. Mahlon and Chilion. And they were Ephrathites. That's the name of their culture, their tribe, from Bethlehem. And they went into the country of Moab and remained there. Now their names mean something. And names are important. Names have meanings. And so their names, the name Elimelech means God is king. I don't know if he trusted God as king though because he, he left his homeland, Israel, and he went to this other land. The name of Naomi means pleasant or happy. And the name of her two sons, it's a little bit weird. It's almost like they maybe knew what was going to happen or, or they had a bad attitude or something. Mahalon means sickness and Chilion means annihilation. Imagine naming your kids that. Well, anyway, it's something weird about that. But basically... The, when the man and the woman went there with the two sons, the man died. Elimelech died. So just Na Naomi was there with her two sons. And the two sons took the wives from the Moabite people. One, the name of one wife was Orpah for the one son. And the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. And both Mahalon and Chilion, the two sons, also died. So all of them died? Except for Naomi, the, the wife. So her husband died and the two sons died. So she was just there and she's left without her husband or her two sons, but she has her daughters-in-law, the girls that were married to the sons, Orpah and Ruth. Orpah means stiff-necked. It means someone that's stubborn. Ruth means neighbor or someone that's a friend, someone you eat with. So these two girls were loyal and even though their husbands had died, they stayed with Naomi and they kind of took care of her. But Naomi arose. She heard that in Israel, back in her hometown in Bethlehem, that there was good crops, that God had blessed his people and there was lots of bread there. And she said, you know what, I'm, we got to leave this place. You know, things have been really bad and I'm going to go back. And so... She arose with her daughters-in-law to return to her country from Moab. And uh, she had heard in Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah and Bethlehem. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Now what do you think she would say to her daughters-in-law? It'd be an interesting question. What would you say? You're in that position. She said, you girls go back to your parents' houses. Go back to your mother's house. Go back and stay in this land. It's your land. You have your customs here. You have your culture. It's a different culture. You have, you can marry a different husband. Mm -hmm. She thought of them and she thought it's going to be a long journey. It's going to be a journey through a desert. It's kind of dangerous. It's like through mountains and dry rocks and then once they get there the people in Israel the people in Bethlehem they didn't really like the people from Moab because the people from Moab first of all they didn't worship the creator they used to worship idols and also they weren't they weren't they didn't treat their kids very well sometimes they would kill their kids to have a good crop sometimes they would they would just not act very well and so the people from Israel were like we don't like the people from Moab and so Naomi was like, well, maybe girls should stay here in your house and, and in your culture. And you have your, your gods, your idols, your, you know, your statues you can worship. And your beds. You have your beds, yeah. And, and the girl said, no, we're going to stay with you. You know, we want to take care of you. You're all alone. So they were pretty nice. And Naomi said, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. These girls had treated their mother-in-law very nicely. Mm -hmm. She said, And the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. You know, go find a new husband. Be well. And she kissed them. And they lifted up their voice and they wept. They all cried. They were sad. And they said, No, we want to stay with you. We want to help you. We want to go with you to your people. And Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they could become your husbands? Because 
you know, if she had sons and they grew up, then maybe they could marry these women. Like, like that was the rules. Your brother, the brother would marry them. But she didn't have any kids, so they'd have to wait like 20 years or something until these, if she had sons, until her boys were old enough and then they could have, she said, you're not going to, are you going to wait that long for me to have kids and then you could have husbands again? And she said, no, you don't want to wait that long. Would you refrain from marrying somebody else? No, it's been exceedingly bitter for me. For your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. It means she, the hand of the Lord, she felt like the Lord had really given her a rough time. And then they lifted up their voices and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, she kissed her goodbye, and she left to go back to Moab. But Ruth clung on to her. What does that mean? Clung on like this. <laughs> she said, I'm not leaving you. And Ruth, and she said, no, look, see your sister-in-law Orpah, she's gone back to her people and to her gods. You go back. Go with your sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. She said, Quit telling me to go away. From where you, She said, For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Where you sleep, I'll sleep. Your house is my house. And your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. Because she learned about Naomi's God, the creator of the universe. She said, I want to be with you and I want to worship your God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me if even death separates us. So she was like, I'm sticking with you. Thanks. If it's anything but death that separates us. And so then Naomi saw, it says, and when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more. It means she stopped telling her to go. She said, okay. So she started walking through the rocks and up the mountain. and Oh, it's a really rough walk from Moab to Bethlehem. And so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they got there, the whole town was stirred up. She'd been gone for over 10 years, but they recognized her. They said, is this Naomi? And they, she said, do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. She said, call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. She probably thought, I probably shouldn't have gone away. Should have waited here and trusted, but she went. She said, don't call me Naomi, where the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, with her, returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And the barley harvest is important. That's in the springtime. The barley is the first crop to come up, or one of the first crops to come up. And they were, and I think they did that on purpose so that they could glean. They could be one of the people that goes behind, even though they were poor, they could go behind in the fields and gather some grain and gather some fruit and glean. Because that's what Ruth was going to do to help her and her mother-in-law, Naomi, to work. Uh... It's interesting, the barley harvest, the beginning of barley harvest, is the Passover. And that is, you know what we call that in our culture? Easter time. Oh, yes. That's the Passover. That's when Jesus was crucified. And so, this story goes on. This is only the first chapter of what happens. Oh, wow. And there's, the next chapter is adventures of what happened when they got to Bethlehem. And there was a special guy that owned a field where Ruth went and he actually was related to Naomi and he was a really rich guy and very wonderful his name was Boaz and we're going to learn about Boaz next right, no that's spoilers. in chapter 2 what's that? no spoilers yeah we won't get <laughs> farther ahead than that alright um, and one thing I really wanted to mention and look at was how Ruth it was so interesting how Ruth was willing to give up her culture and everything to say, I want to be with you, Naomi. I'll go with you. Your home will be my home. Your God will be my God. I want to be with you and your people, even to death and beyond. And so I think that she shows that she's really loyal and she shows that she's really um, going to take care of her mother-in-law, even to the point where she's like, okay, I won't go and try to find a husband for my people. But we'll see how, you know, 
obviously Naomi's had a really rough time. She lost her husband and her two sons. But things change. 